engineering calculations to solve geotechnical problems involve stress strain, load deformation, time dependent deformations, water soil interaction, soil structure interaction, and, and a lot more. So a few approaches to performing these calculations are using closed form solutions, empirical solutions, and numerical solutions. The closed form solutions or classical solutions, they require some kind of idealization or assumptions to be able to describe the problem um, using a set of mathematical equations. Empirical solutions are usually performance based and they require a large amount of field monitor monitoring and a large amount of field measurements. So then taking the data collected, it, needed, it needs to be corresponded with laboratory results and design calculations. Uh, consequently, consequently, these solutions are dependent on the geographic location and local practice. A numerical solution is a technique for finding approximate solutions to partial differential equations. And one of these techniques is finite element analysis, or in short, FEA. FEA basically is a method for dividing up a very complicated problem into small elements that can be solved in relation to each other. And FEA is growing in the field of geotechnical engineering because it allows the geotechnical engineer to decrease the amount of assumptions, idealizations in both the soil properties, the soil behavior, the subsoil layering systems, loading and boundary conditions. Now for the simpler geotechnical problems, the first two methods can be used. How, however, most geotechnical problems aren't very simple since they typically involve very complex geometry and soil structure interaction. And for that reason, I'd like to focus on the third method, specifically finite element analysis. Finite element analysis has been used in many fields of engineering for over 30 years. It is now becoming the norm for analyzing geotechnical problems. Although it is becoming standard practice, engineers should not use FEA software as a black box tool where information is input and a result is provided by the software and that's final. Doing so could result and most likely will result in the wrong predictions which in turn will affect the overall design and or your solution. So to perform useful geotechnical finite element analysis, an engineer must have an understanding of soil mechanics, the constitutive soil models, including their limitations, finite element theory, how the software works, and have enough experience to judge the outcomes of the analysis. So before jumping right into solving problems with software, it is important for the engineer to get the, that proper training. Only then will finite element analysis mean something. So it is worth the time to become familiar, familiar with finite element analysis because it is definitely a powerful tool and it really helps clients visualize what is happening. And it has many applications. Here are just some examples of where FEA can be used. Um, it can be used to evaluate bearing capacity of shallow footings and mat foundations for the analysis of axially and laterally loaded single vertical or battered piles, pile groups, and drilled shafts. Um, it could be used for analysis of stage construction of embankments for highways, railroads, and levees, as well as the analysis and design of earth retaining structures such as sheet pile walls, soldier pile, pile walls, tieback walls, and MSE walls. It could also be used for seepage analysis of, of levees and dams. So depending on the geometry of the problem, FEA can be modeled in either 2D or 3D. The 2D model types are plane strain and axisymmetric. Plane strain models can be used where one dimension is very large compared with the other two. So loads and boundary conditions are independent of the larger dimensions and displacements in the long direction are considered to be zero. So a few examples are long straight embankments, long straight retaining walls, 
and long straight levees and dikes. In axisymmetric models, the geometry, the boundary conditions, and initial stresses have a rotational symmetry around a central axis. And the displacements in the circumferential direction or around the axis of symmetry are considered to be zero. And a few examples of, of an axisymmetric case are for circular footing, footings and tanks, single piles, and vertical wells. All other cases that don't fall under plane strain and axisymmetric models, they must be modeled in 3D. Examples of this include pad footings, mat foundations, piled raft foundations, lateral loaded pile and pile groups, inclined piles or groups of piles, tunnel intersections, and basically anything that has a very complicated 3D geometry or out-of-plane loading. So keeping all of that in mind, now let's look at our four-story hotel. So here's the story. A developer had planned to place a four-story wood frame hotel with an irregular footing layout as shown here at the bottom at a site where the subsurface is made up of a soft compressible soil layer and bedrock is about 30 feet deep. Now the geotechnical engineer had produced a, a report voicing the concern of settlement issues. The owner and design team talk over the possible solutions that include options to either use reinforced grade beam style spread footings or deep foundations by way of micro piles or drill piles. They originally decided to go with the reinforced grade beam style spread footings since the deep foundations would have been way too expensive. However, the geotechnical engineer comes back and stated that the owner would have to take the risk of settlement by using that type of system. And since the owner did not want to take that risk, we looked into using a ground improvement system that consisted of rigid inclusions to increase the capacity of the soil and take care of that settlement issue. For this particular system, the rigid inclusions were constructed of 18-inch diameter holes that were drilled to bedrock and then backfilled with low-strength grout, uh, about 1,800 PSI. Basically, the inclusions for this case were low-strength auger cast piles with no steel reinforcement. The inclusions were then designed to be overlain with a two-feet thick load transfer mat um, constructed of compacted on-site soils with a layer of geogrid at the center. This mat was added to the system to help spread the footing loads to the inclusions. Now this ground improvement system was ultimately chosen by the owner because it is cost effective, mainly due to the low cost of materials and low equipment costs for installation of the system. The installation is fairly quick as well with installation of about 30 to 40 rigid inclusions per day. So for a project with, say, 120 rigid inclusions, a contractor could be finished installing in about three to four days. So after the owner made the decision to go with this system, the team had to validate that this system will perform. So we were hired to validate that the system will reduce the risk of settlement um, and because of the geometry of the footings and the use of the inclusions, the reasonable, the reasonable approach was to use a 3D finite element analysis. And using the 3D analysis, the vertical displacements and the corresponding differential settlements were found for three different scenarios. First, for comparison, the settlements were checked for the hotel on shallow foundations only. Then, to find the best layout, the model was analyzed with rigid inclusions on a 10 foot by 10 foot grid and with the inclusions placed along the footings at about a 10 foot spacing. Our initial thought was that placing the inclusions along the footing would definitely be more effective in controlling the settlement, but completing a finite element analysis would answer that question. The finite element analysis for this project was completed using MIDAS GTS. The program input consists of the geometry including 
the soil stratigraphy, the transfer mat dimensions, the footing dimensions, and the rigid inclusions, as well as their respective material properties. Um, the solid geometry broken up into small elements by meshing, boundary conditions applied to the mesh, and loads applied to the system. The geotechnical report and the boring logs for this project indicated about 24 feet of fill and residual soil, followed by a layer of decomposed rock with bedrock at a depth of about 30 feet. So this soil stratigraphy was created in MIDAS GTS as shown here. The images show the different layers of the subsurface as well as the footing layout. Again, here, here you can see that the footing layout is a bit complex. And MIDAS GTS has the option to import 2D or 3D CAD files. And taking advantage of this, the footings shown here in red and the inclusions were drawn using CAD and was imported into MIDAS GTS. The footings were drawn as a, a planar surface and were extruded in MIDAS GTS to have the correct thickness. And one thing I want to mention is that it is very important to make sure that all of the faces of the footings are in contact with each other and, and also in contact with the ground. This ensures that the loads applied to the footings will be correctly transferred to the ground. This keeps us in tune with uh, finite element theory, basically breaking up the problem into small elements and solving the equations for the elements in relation to each other. So if the elements aren't connected to each other, then the program would most likely crash or take a, just a large amount of time to compute, and the results would be incorrect. For this project, since the bedrock was encountered at 30 feet, the inclusions were designed to be drilled to bedrock. Um, in the model, the inclusions were simplified to be a, a 3D line. And a, or an alternative is to model each inclusion as an actual cylinder with an interface surface between the inclusion and the soil to model that soil structure interaction. But this would require a lot more elements and a lot more computation time. Again, for this project, since the inclusions were planned to be drilled to bedrock, uh, they were modeled with line elements, as shown in the, mid in the image on the top right. After the geometry was input into MIDAS GTS, the material properties of the different parts of the model were input. For the concrete footings, an elastic model was used since plasticity does not have a big role in concrete. The elastic model is based on Hooke's law of linear isotropic elasticity. It has only two main parameters, Young's modulus E and Poisson's ratio nu. So for the soil and transfer mat, the more Coulomb soil model was used. The more Coulomb model is an elastic, perfectly plastic model and it forms a combination of Hooke's law and the generalized form of Coulomb's failure criterion. This model involves five parameters, basically the two elastic parameters from Hooke's laws, uh, Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio, and the two parameters from Coulomb's failure criterion, the friction angle and cohesion. And it also, this model also involves the latency angle. Now, for the rigid inclusions, an elastic structural model was used. The inclusions are modeled as an elastic material with a compressive strength of about 1,800 PSI. And that image to the right just shows you the, the input for the different material properties. And, and it's basically um, easy to, to enter the properties into there. So then using the appropriate material properties, the different geometrical solids were each meshed into many elements. Um, line elements underneath the footings were used for the rigid inclusions. And MIDAS GTS has several options to ensure that there is nodal connectivity, which is very important in finite element analysis. After the mesh was created, 
ground boundary conditions were applied to the mesh. It's, it's very important to place the ground boundary conditions far enough away from the critical zone of the model. Um, this is done so that the boundary conditions conditions do not influence the critical zone. And following the installation of the inclusions, the transfer mat uh, must be constructed. And to model this condition, the transfer mat material properties were increased by changing the material properties of the mat and applying this boundary condition in the stage after the inclusions are activated. The last step of the input was to specify the self-weight of the soil and the wall footing loads. The loads were applied on top of the footings as shown here as a pressure to simulate the loads from the walls. So before running the model, the, the construction stages must be defined. The first stage was to calculate the initial stresses in the natural condition with self-weight activated. For the in situ case, only the soils were activated in the model. Then an excavation is made for the transfer mat, so the mesh representing the transfer mat was deactivated. And before the transfer mat is placed, the rigid inclusions are installed, so the line elements representing the inclusions were activated before the transfer mat was reactivated. And then the footings were activated, the loads were applied to the footings, and the model was run. So here's just a top view of the vertical displacements calculated by the program for the case without the inclusions. The model predicted a maximum vertical displacement of about two inches. Um, as indicated by the, the areas in blue, the differential sediment is about 1.78 inches. This is simply calculated by finding the maximum vertical displacement and subtracting the minimum vertical displacement within the building footprint. So without inclusions, we have a maximum vertical displacement of about two inches and a differential sediment of about 1.78 inches. By adding the inclusions into the model on a 10 foot by 10 foot grid and including the transfer mat in the model, the, the maximum vertical displacement is reduced from two inches down to about three quarters of an inch. And the, differ and the differential sediment is calculated to be about 0 0.73 inches. So using the rigid inclusions, you can see that there is definitely a big decrease in, in vertical displacement, as well as a, a big difference in uh, differential sediment. Now, by using about the same amount of inclusions um, as in the 10 foot by 10 foot grid and placing them along the footings and in between the walls, uh, just having a few in between the walls to take care of the floating slab, the maximum vertical displacements and differential displacement is reduced down to about 0 0.21 inches. So the finite element analysis showed that the ground improvement system does decrease the maximum vertical displacement as well as the differential displacement. It also showed that placing the inclusions along the footings is the best way to go. If we were to look back at our project goals, we were able to validate the effectiveness of the ground improvement um, using rigid inclusions as well as show the best layout would be to place the inclusions along the footings instead of placing them on a, a 10 foot by 10 foot grid. So we were able to validate the system and, and optimize the rigid inclusion layout. And for this project, it would have been difficult to validate the system if we weren't able to analyze this in 3D. And using finite element analysis made this possible. And I encourage all of you to explore the possibilities of finite element analysis. I encourage you to do this because for this particular project, using rigid inclusions presented 
uh, a savings of about 50% over deep foundations. Now, typical savings could possibly range from 25 to 30, 35% at suitable project sites. So with that being said, I want to thank you for taking the time to attend this webinar. Thank you for taking the time to listen, and I'd like to thank Midasoft for the opportunity to give this webinar. Um, if we have some time, if there are any questions, we could take that now. If not, I'll, I'll take your questions through email.